Chapter Twenty Nine. That evening, Mama said nothing about our impending separation. The night was unusually quiet. There was none of the customary noise, no tramp of marching feet, and no chorus of hate. In the morning, Mama explained what was about to happen. I will be going away, she said. Eden will come with me. Emma and Ethan will stay in the center, but I will come back for you soon. Ethan moped. I looked at my mother's sad, tired eyes, and fought back my tears. She tried to cheer us up, but our spirits would not be lifted. After breakfast, we began packing. A woman came to our apartment and notified Mama of a meeting at which officials would announce where she was going to be sent. Mama said it didn't matter where she attended the me- whether she attended the meeting; everything had been decided. She sent me in her place. I listened to the reading of names and villages. I wrote the information in my notebook and ran home. Mama, they are sending you to Hexian County, Xiaohe Village. I announced. They said this village is far from the county headquarters. They said there will be one room for you, but no electricity. Mama listened in shock. She asked, "Are you sure?" I showed her my notes. The color drained from her face. "How can this be?" she asked. "How can we live there?" She started talking as if speaking to my father. "Ninquan," she said, "whatever happened to the five hams they promised us? They said we'd have a house, have a stove." Have a water jar. Have food. Have a salary. Her voice rose and broke. After momentary silence, she left. She found others who had been at the meeting and asked about their assigned villages. As she suspected, her village was the most remote and primitive. She went to the headquarters. Of the propaganda team and asked to see the leader. Please allow me to trade my village for another. She begged, at least a village with accessible transportation. I have three small children to care for. He listened, but said nothing. After she had, she had her say, he went back to his work. As if she were not present, she stood in front of him silently for several minutes. When she realized he did not intend to respond, she came home. That afternoon, a red guard came to our apartment and announced, "Li Yikai, we have decided to allow you to exchange your assignment with another teacher." You will be sent to Xipu District, Sunbo Commune, Xinjian Work Brigade, Gaozhong Production Team. This village is not in the mountains; it's on the plain, and it's only ten miles from the Hexian County headquarters and near a main road. You will be given one and a half room. And you will have electricity. Mama beamed and said, "Thank you." She was increasingly anxious as the deadline for departure neared. We all worked hard packing. I boxed coal briquettes for the stove. 
Mama filled bags with kitchen utensils, dishes, and other supplies, along with clothing. We disassembled the beds and tied them up. Two days before the move, I became ill. Mama put me to bed and monitored my temperature. Around ten o'clock that night, my condition worsened, and she decided. To carry me to the clinic, she trudged down the middle of the abandoned street, taking short, quick steps, panting heavily. She held me so tightly, I could feel the pounding of her heart. She called my name to make sure I was conscious. "Mama," she whispered, "Are you okay?" And I would reply. I'm okay, Mama. After we'd gone several blocks, I found I could no longer speak. The door of the clinic was locked. Mama knocked, but there was no response. She pounded desperately on the door, crying, "Help me! My child is ill." I drifted in and out of consciousness. Mama's voice faded, and rose. Her plea sounded as if it came from a great distance. The night air was cold, and I was drenched in sweat and shivering. A light came on. The bolt clicked, and the door opened a crack. A short, stout, frowning woman appeared in night clothing. Are you mad? She sputtered. What's wrong with you? My little girl is very ill, Mama said. The woman peered around the door and looked at me. And what do you want me to do? She asked. Get a doctor. Impossible, the woman said. There's no doctor on duty at this hour. She started to close the door. Mama stuck her foot inside and prevented her from shutting it. She asked, "Who is a doctor on duty during the day?" "It's Doctor Tang." "Where does she live?" "I'll take my child there." The woman stared at her in astonishment. "Please," Mama cried, "Where does she live?" The woman hesitated before saying, "Building one twenty-seven, number nine, third floor." But you didn't hear it from me. Thank you, Mama said. The door slammed and the lock clicked and the light went out. Mama hurried down the street with me. I heard no sound. But Mama's labored breathing. Suddenly, a dog rushed out of the dark and began growling and snapping at Mama's ankles. I smelled and heard the animal beside us. Mama wove her way down the street as the dog repeatedly lunged at her. Several times. It nipped at her heels, and when she kicked back, it raced around us. Other dogs began to bark in the distance. I feared the racket came from wild dogs that slunk into the city each night to eat garbage and the bodies of dead counter-revolutionaries. I was petrified. The snarls of the animals chasing us became ferocious. Mama slowed, and stood still. The dog raced from side to side. Its head kept low. Its eyes glowering as it approached. With my remaining strength, I put my arms around Mama's neck. And tried to pull myself up. The dog hesitated, ceased barking, and warily approached Mama. 
smelled her feet and legs, then raised its head and sniffed the bundle she was carrying. When it was finished, it sat and looked at us. Mama cautiously resumed her journey. She didn't dare run and provoke the animal. The dog acted as if it sensed the urgency in Mama's actions. It no longer sought to intimidate her, but rather to accompany her through the street. Mama arrived at building 127 and carried me up to the third floor. She strained to read the numbers on the doors. When she found number nine, she kicked at the door softly. There was no response. She yelled, her voice more desperate and plaintive with each word. Dr. Tang, is Dr. Tang at home? This is an emergency, please help me. A light came on inside. The scratch of slippers across the floor was followed by a voice, harsh and unhappy. Who the hell is making such a noise in the middle of the night? My daughter is very ill, Mama said. What does she have? I don't know, but I'm afraid she's near death. How do you know? She has a high fever. She has no energy. She can't move. Can she open her eyes? I opened my eyes when I heard this. Yes, Mama said. She just opened her eyes. Can she speak? Say something, Mama whispered. I'm here, Mama, I murmured. The voice inside said, she doesn't sound sick to me. Go away. Mama begged Dr. Tang to look at me, but the physician refused to open the door. Wait till tomorrow. I'll see her then, Dr. Tang advised. The light went out and we were left alone. Mama concluded that if she persisted in pleading, the doctor might refuse to see me in the morning. She carefully carried me down the dark stairs and out of the building. The dog was waiting for us and started barking and jumping around. Other dogs joined in a distant howling chorus. A moment later, a pack of them, all snapping and barking ferociously, ran at us. In a tr tremulous but defiant voice, Mama began talking while flicking her foot to keep them at bay. Go ahead, she dared. Take a bite of my leg. See how it tastes. Then nobody can send me to the countryside. The barking ceased. The animals quieted and withdrew. Mama stood still as the dogs circled us, sniffing the air. The biggest dog in the pack approached wearily and smelled Mama's feet and her burden. The others watched him. The lead dog sidled up to Mama, lifted his hind legs and relieved himself on her feet. When he was done, he trotted away and the others approached. Two more dogs paused to pee. Then, as suddenly as they appeared, as if on a signal, they were gone. Mama let out a long sigh and laughed. Oh, at least it's warm, she said. She shook her feet and resumed her way home. Later, Mama laid cool, wet towels over my forehead, arms, and legs to control my temperature. She was there throughout the night, bathing me, stroking my hair, whispering encouragement. 
In the morning, she carried me to the clinic. Dr. Tang saw us immediately. She said nothing about the previous night. She examined me, pronounced me not seriously ill, and prescribed a potion. After I'd taken the medicine, Mama ran to the office of the leader of the propaganda team to ask for more time to prepare to leave. My daughter is very sick, she told him. I have been up all night and was unable to finish packing. I'm requesting permission for my husband to come home and help me. He looked at her in astonishment and burst out laughing. Ha! You actually expect me to do that? He said. Li Kai, you're even more stupid than I imagined. Go home. I'll send someone to help you. That afternoon, a university instructor, a notorious and outspoken ultra-leftist, arrived to assist us in packing. The unusually short woman, who always seemed to be squinting at the world through her thick, wire-rimmed glasses, was celebrated for her ability to root out enemies of the people. She was childless and had a distaste of children. Instead of assisting us, she unpacked some bags and examined every item inside. She was particularly interested in the books. Then she started to page through them. Mama said, toilet paper. Yes, she responded, that's all they're good for. She abruptly departed at dinner time. Thank you for your help, Mama said as she left. This house is a mess, she shot back. Eating worked throughout the day. He rolled up the blankets and tied them in neat bundles. Mama saw his work and smiled and recalled how poorly she had tied her pack for the first journey into the countryside. We could travel around the world, she said, and this would never come loose. Such a good job. The day of departure was May 16th, a big ceremony commemorating the exodus was planned. 200 families were to leave the campus that morning. The night before, 200 trucks had arrived to transport them. They lined up bumper to bumper along the university campus. The truck, the truck designated for our family parked near the front door to our building. We stacked our belongings on the bed of the truck and Eden tied them down. We completed our work just before midnight. When everything was set, we went back to our apartment. As we prepared to sleep on the bare floor, we saw a flash of lightning outside, followed by a roll of thunder. Minutes later, a heavy downpour began. All of our belongings on the truck were exposed to the rain. Mama saw that the beds on all of the other trucks had been secured and covered with large, heavy tarpaulins. There was none for our truck. Mama ordered us inside and hurried to a driver's apartment. He answered, angry at having been awakened. Why are you here? He growled. I have to drive all day tomorrow and I need my rest. Everyone's truck is covered but ours. I want ours covered, she said. I'm a driver, he shot back. What in the hell can I do about it? 
Mama ran home. She and Eding began unloading the truck, carrying the belongings inside and stacking them in the hall. Eding never complained. I felt so sorry for him. He crawled onto the truck and untied the ropes he'd lashed across our sinks, threw them aside, and handed the bags and boards to Mama. Mama wrung out the blankets and laid them flat on the floor. We did not finish unpacking and sorting and drying until dawn. The rain stopped an hour later. Mama and Eding moved our belongings back onto the truck. They finished tying everything down minutes before an announcement on the loudspeakers that it was time for everyone to assemble at the sports ground. The drivers crawled into the cabs of their trucks and drove there. We walked to the assembly point with thrones of others. By the time we arrived, thousands of people were already gathered. Each of the departees was given a red paper flower to pin over his heart, a small ribbon with the slogan, to settle down is glorious, was attached. The supreme, the supreme ruler of the province, a PLA commander, took the stage. Congratulations, he shouted. You are all answering Chairman Mao's call. You are settling down in the villages to learn from the peasants. Become one of them. Through physical labor, you will transform your bourgeois views. We salute you. We congratulate you. The commander was not leaving Hefei yet. He celebrated the heroism of those who were. He concluded by waving a little red book over his head and shouting, Victory on Chairman Mao's revolutionary road! The crowd repeated the phrase. When the commander was done, other party dignitaries followed him to the platform and repeated word for word what he'd already said. Everyone cheered. Yichun fell asleep in Mama's arms. I glanced at Yiding and noticed he was struggling to stay awake. A command blared over the loudspeakers for the departees to get into their trucks. The moment of our separation had come. Mama turned to me and said, Ima, your little brother is in your care. When I'm settled, I'll come back for you. Go to school and study hard. She gave me a dreary look. She hugged Yi Chun and put him down. He grasped my hand. Mama and Yi Ding climbed into the truck beside the driver who smoked and stared into space. I noticed liberation model printed in metallic characters along the side of the truck's hood. At a signal, the drivers started their engines and honked their horns. There was a tremendous roar and the air was filled with blue fumes. I waved my hand in front of my face to clear the air, and Yichun buried his face in my shirt. I watched Mama as she leaned out the window and waved at us. I wished she would open the door and run back to us. The streets were lined with poor, with people singing and dancing and waving little red books. The scene brought back the memory of my parents marching away earlier. This time, 
Mama was going with my older brother and leaving me in charge. The trucks rumbled past, and Ethan and I waved and yelled, "Goodbye, Mama! Goodbye, Eating!" Shortly after four p.m., Mama's truck arrived at Gall Village. The driver jumped out. Mama watched as people approached the truck from nearby hovels. A short man. Wearing soiled clothing and no shoes, strutted in front of the others. He held a symbol, the size of a large plate, in one hand, and a stick in the other. As he neared the truck, he lifted the symbol, and began pounding on it with a stick. The symbol had a hole in it. It made a pathetic banging, like. An old tin can. Nonetheless, he struck it vigorously. He had a swollen face. His hair was unkempt. His teeth were stained amber. One of his eyes rolled around, seemingly independent of the other. He reeked of alcohol and was unsteady on his legs. From the corner of his mouth, drooped the stub of a cigarette. I am Li Tinghai. He slurred. His accent was so heavy, my mother had a difficulty understanding. I am the head of this village. This is your settled down, cadre. The driver volunteered. "Oh shit!" Li Tinghai muttered, and gave my mother a sudden, a sullen glare. A woman in the group cackled, "Don't call him Li Tinghai. Just call him Lao Pang Hai, old crab." The man exploded. "You shut up, you filthy slut!" He extracted a crumpled. Piece of paper from his pocket, and waved it menacingly at her. See this? See this? Six articles of public security. Any of you? He waved at the others. Will fall in, who will fall into the six articles as a counter-revolutionary if you make trouble? Then you will be shot. You old fart," a young man said. "You can't read that." Everyone burst out laughing. Old crab turned to my mother. "What's your name?" he snapped. "I am Li Yikai." And that," he said, nodding toward my brother, cowering in the truck. "My son, eating." Ah. <sighs> Two more mouths to feed. He spat out his cigarette stub, and circled the truck, examining our belongings. I don't suppose you brought any cigarettes, did you? He asked. No. I'm sorry, my mother replied. Old crab approached the driver and asked for a cigarette. The driver grudgingly handed him one. He asked for another. For my brother, he explained. The driver gave him another. He put it in his pocket, and the two men stood smoking and chatting. The driver told my mother and Eding to unload their belongings and hurry, he said. I have to get back to Hefei tonight. Old Crab shouted. Put that stuff on the ground, and I'll decide later what to do with it. Mama and Eding began unloading, as the others watched. End of chapter twenty-nine. Chapter thirty. I returned to the center with Eton. Although school was in session, nothing much was taught. 
Students spent almost all the time singing revolutionary songs and reciting Chairman Mao's quotations. We bowed to the bust of Mao and read the little red book and the three old articles, Serve the People, in memory of Dr. Norman Bethune and the foolish man who moved a mountain. We read them every day until we could recite them perfectly, line by line. That was our education. I was solely responsible for my little brother. Eating was gone and all of the other children had departed with their parents. One morning, I went shopping with my ration coupon and tried to buy candy for Yichun. I searched for nearly an hour, but could find none. I decided instead to get him a toy. All of the available toys were political, so I paid four fun and bought him a small paper portrait of Chairman Mao standing on Tiananmen waving to red guards. I had heard in school that holding a portrait or icon of Chairman Mao was energizing. It give, will give you 10,000 pounds of energy, was one of the things our teachers taught us. In return, you had to be very respectful toward it. On the way back to the center, I became exhausted. I rested on the steps of a building. I didn't feel well, so I took out the picture of Mao and prayed for him to give me energy, make me strong and well. Nothing happened. I started to think about everything I'd been taught to believe about Chen Mao and the party. It dawned on me that it was all lies. I felt ridiculous holding a piece of paper and praying to it. I looked around at children with their little red books, the red guards chanting, the soldiers offering to serve the people. I looked at all of the drab clothing and the blank stares and the short haircuts of young women in shapeless slacks and soiled shirts, posters praising or condemning this or that person. I sense the deep sadness of people buried beneath all the shouting and the slogans. I sensed the true sadness of grandmother, Auntie Liang, Xiaolan, Mama, and Papa. I saw the unhappiness of everything and everybody. My ears had been filled with the ecstatic noise of the teachers and the crowds at parades as our parents left us behind of the weeping of families broken apart, of the pleas of innocent people punished for being born into the wrong family, of the cries from people being beaten and dragged away. Could I be the only one who saw this for what it was? Everyone was pretending and everyone was afraid and Everyone was wearing a mask. I felt more alone than ever. I wondered if this was what Auntie Liang knew the night she left Xiaolan at the center. I wondered what might happen to me alone in this vast sea of liars. Mama sent me a letter saying she had arranged to bring my little brother to the village. I was to stay in Hefei, since the PLA was still in charge of the university 
a PLA soldier would bring Yichun to her. She enclosed money and ration coupons. I went shopping and bought Yichun a new pair of shoes and candy and cookies. A few days later, the soldier arrived. I was uneasy when I saw the young man. I didn't trust soldiers. I scrutinized this one carefully, looked into his eyes to see if I might see anything frightening. I listened to his voice for the tone I'd heard from the soldier who had hurt me. This soldier was young and seemed to be honest and trustworthy. I gave him 50 fun and four ounces of rice coupons so he could buy a bowl of rice for Yichun on the journey. I explained to Yichun that he was going to join Mama and eating. He left without a word. I watched him leave the center with the soldier carrying a box of cookies. I no longer had anyone to care for. There was no one to talk to when school was not in session. I sat on the floor and read or stared out the window. Days passed. Each one seemed the same. I developed a fever. When I tried to eat, I vomited. I drank warm water and ate nothing. Soon I had throbbing headaches that felt like there was a stone rolling around in my heart, head. I skipped school and stayed in my room. The supervisors forgot me. One night my head hurt so much that I cried out for help, but no one answered. I cried for Mama. Finally, I drifted into a hazy delirium. After a sleepless night, I decided it was time to stop leaving. I knew I was near death, but I wasn't afraid. I remembered Grandma and Auntie Liang, and I knew they would take care of me. I waited for death. I had visions of my brothers and mama and papa eating together at a table in the village. They didn't miss me. I breathed a cheerless, lonely soliloquy to the bare walls and the cold floor. I called to Auntie Liang. At last, she heard me and replied. I saw her face in the window. I opened my eyes wide and smiled. I whispered her name and she nodded. I told her I wanted to go outside and make snow butterflies. She held out her hand and beckoned me to come with her. Her skin was radiant. Her eyes sparkled like stars in the black winter sky. I'm coming, Auntie Liang, I said. I raised my arms to embrace her. End of chapter 30